Hey guys, so in this video I'm going to be talking more about the EG4 12,000 XP. So I want to cover some of the questions I got in the comments on the previous video and do some more testing on the unit. So if you guys missed the first video I did on this inverter, you may want to go and check that out first. I can put a link above there to the last video, but does anybody actually click on those and leave the video they're watching? I don't know, but anyway, I'll put the link up there for you guys to check out if you need to. So I'm gonna jump right into it here. The first thing I wanna cover is how much solar this unit can take in. So on the spec sheet, it can use up to 24,000 watts of solar. So before I get into how I would manage that, I wanted to discuss how big that is. So most inverters, so, so like say the 6000 XP, it's to my left, I don't think you guys can see it over there, to your right, but it can take in 8,000 watts of solar but the inverter, it can output 6,000 watts. So you're talking around a, a 2,000 watts there that you can charge the batteries with, which is really good. Like that's, that's what you want. You wanna be, be able to take in more solar than the output can use. That way you're constantly charging as you're outputting at the same time. That's more of a motivation for people to add plenty of solar on their system. That way they can get plenty of charging done at the same time. So you're not wasting any of that sunlight. So say you had a dryer on or something like that, you don't want that to just be evening out your power supply. You want to be able to charge at the same time, if possible. So with this unit at that kind of wattage, you could essentially charge at the same rate you're discharging. So you could be charging your batteries at 250 amps while you're discharging at 250 amps. And if you have enough solar, that entire thing would be covered by the sun, which is really neat. So if you guys wanted to get to that 24,000 watt number, how would you do it? So in my opinion, the easiest way to get there would be with a combiner box. So lots and lots of people were using them just a few years ago, but as voltages went higher, people kind of shied away from them now and they're just running panels in series to their inverters. I still have both of my combiner boxes in use still from my first install. They are from Watts 24 seven. I think they carry some of the best combiner boxes out there. And if you guys need, I can do a video on that, on how to wire a combiner box to make things simpler for you if you guys need that. But yeah, as the name implies, you're going to be combining your strings together. And so it's paralleling them inside that box in a safe way with surge protection too. Most of them come with surge protection as well. And then from there, it could go to your inverter. And so the easiest way that I've seen, especially with some of the latest panels that I see on sites, would be to have three different strings in each input. But since you only have two inputs, you're gonna need something to be able to combine them before they get to the inverter. So there's a lot of different choices for panels. And this isn't exactly a Goldilocks inverter. It doesn't have to have everything just right there, but you do have to pick a specific panel if you're gonna to try to get right at that uh, 24,000 watts. And that's another thing I wanted to cover here. If you're in a different, in a warmer region, then that temperature coefficient is gonna be different for you guys. So how many panels you can put in series, it's gonna be a little different per region. So if you're in Florida, for instance, you can almost panel them right up to that VOC limit. So it really depends, but I'm just giving you guys kind of a broad idea of how to do this, or rather how I would do this, I guess. So for an example, I'm gonna show you guys the Q-Cell panels at Signature Solar. They're 405 watt panels. And you can see here on the specs, they are 45 volts open circuit. So again, depending on your region, it would depend on how many you're gonna put in series, but let's assume you put nine in series. Where I'm at, I would be well below the voltage limit of this inverter, even in cold weather. So I would do three different strings of nine and then bring it into the inverter here. So you can do that a couple ways. You could combine two strings and send them in and then send the other string directly from the array in as well, that's probably the easiest way to do it. Your combiner box could be a four, two, they call it, and I'll leave a link for these, but you're gonna bring two of those strings in and one will come out. And then for the second input, you could do two in and then one out. So that would occupy the entire box. So that's one way to do it. And like I said, the second string could come directly from the array. And that's gonna to apply to the second panel I'm gonna show you here as an example. But assuming you did that and brought three strings of these Q-cell panels into the inverter, you'd be just below 11,000 watts on one input. So you'd be just shy of the 24,000 watts, you'd be at 22,000 watts, something like that, if you brought these into the inverter that way. And in this highly sophisticated diagram, you'll see kind of what I was talking about before, 
where I would run four strings into the combiner box. And then out of that combiner box, I would run one of those strings to PV1, and then the second to PV2. And then from the array, I would just run directly one to PV1, one to PV2. So I hope that helps. Uh, it could be a little bit more detailed, obviously. It's the best I could come up with at the time, but yeah, you could do this differently too. It could be a larger combiner box and it could you could run the strings differently. This is just kind of an example I'm giving you guys on how it could be done. But yeah, the strings coming out of the combiner box would already be paralleled. And then you would just have the second string coming from the array. But I'll show you a second example. These are the Sirius 415 watt bifacial panels. And you can see on the specs here, the amperage is 13.9, so it's actually a little higher than the other panel. So it really depends on how they design the panel. And your voltage is gonna be a little lower. So with these, you could easily put 10 in series and still stay right in that kind of voltage range that you wanna be in this inverter anyway for optimal usage. And again, combine two strings, bring it in, and send the other one directly from the array if you wanna do that, do it that way. And that's right around 12,400 watts coming into this inverter. But if you look, the amperage is gonna be just a little higher than the usable amperage on this. So it can use 35 amps per input. You can exceed that, and the inverter is only going to use what it needs. So technically the amperage is going to be around 41 amps, something like that, as you send it in. So you're going to have a little bit of clipping there, but you should be close to that 12,000 watts, maybe a smidge under again. And I could keep looking at examples of panels, but you kind of get the gist, or at least how I would do it. And keep messing with the numbers, keep looking at the amperage. Keep in mind that as you parallel the panels, so as you combine them together in parallel, it's going to raise the amperage. I hope that explanation wasn't too long-winded and made sense to people. As you up that amperage, it, you need to up your wire gauge. Technically, I would use an eight gauge wire if you're going to be combining something in a combiner box and then sending it in. So depending on what panels you choose, you may be around 26 amps or 27 amps, 28 amps, whatever it is you're sending in. Yeah, I would use an eight gauge wire. Feel free to ask more questions about that. If you guys need any help with that, just let me know. The next thing I wanted to cover is when the fans actually sort of get noisy with this inverter. So at what wattage? So here we are, we're at 3000 watts and it's pretty much whisper quiet. I can hear the charge inverter in the background that I'm using for the load test. But the inverter here is very quiet. So at what point does it start, start to get sort of loud? With the 18 kPV, it's right at that 6,000 watt mark where the fans even kick on. This does have really low fans right now, so they are on, but you can hardly hear them. All right, so the charge verter is just about maxed out over there, and we are at 5,500 watts of output, and the fans are very quiet still. You can hear them, they're moving air, but there's not a lot of noise coming from the unit. So I'm thinking it's probably gonna be in that six to 7,000 watt range where we start to get a little bit more noise. So let me put some pressure on the unit and see what happens. Yeah, so it's right at that 6,000 watt mark where you can start to hear the fans a lot more. So it's not like an 18K PV where there's no fans at all until 6,000 watts, but it certainly is when the fans really start to kick in. And then above the 7,000 watt mark, they do get louder for sure. While I've got everything running, it's probably a good time to try and test a little bit more on inductive loads even. So we've got L1 here, it already has 2700 watts on it. And I can put the heater on. And we've got L1 up to 4200 watts. So I'm gonna start my miter saw, big DeWalt miter saw and cut something and see if that will trip the unit on L1 as an imbalance that is. Well, that was pretty crazy considering how large of an inductive startup load the miter saw is. So I put a heat gun on L1 as well. So we're right at 5,000 watts and we'll see if it can still start up the miter saw.
I'm sure you saw there, it went over 7,000 watts on L1. But that's actually a really good thing. So that way people know if they're running this inverter and just re running their regular household stuff, if somebody's in the shop and they start up a saw, if they start up a compressor, it's not just gonna kick out if it exceeds that 6,000 watts. It can take a surge on the leg. It just can't sustain, you know, over 6,300 watts. But it can surge up well past that. Doesn't seem to have an issue. All right, I'm determined to overload L1. So I'm gonna start the saw up. I've got it at 5,600 watts on L1 now. So I'm gonna go ahead and start the saw up again and see what happens. I'm sure at this point it will overload because of an imbalance. <laughs> That's funny. I thought I overloaded the inverter, but I just overloaded the circuit. I actually tripped the breaker because I was trying to do it all on one. I didn't have everything wired up to be able to do two different 20 amp circuits here. So yeah, I ended up tripping the breaker before I tripped the inverter. I think we got up to 7,800 watts on L1, but it did cut. So I didn't have a problem with that. Yeah, it's this one here. Pushed that little guy too hard. Started the heat gun up again. Okay, so after I did that last test, I went back and looked at the footage to see how high the wattage went. Cause I think it, I thought it was like in the 7,000 watt range but then it looked like it was a lot higher. So it looked like in the 9,000 watt range. So I went back and put a clamp meter on it. I did the exact same test and I came up with 78.5 amps. So we're somewhere around the 9,400 watt range. And yeah, that tripped the breaker, but not the inverter. So it could probably do over 9,400 watts. I just don't have it wired up right now the right way, like I mentioned before. So yeah, that is impressive. Over 9,400 watts on a single leg for a surge. All right, so next thing I wanna talk about is AC coupling. So that is typically a feature, like I mentioned in my last video, typically a feature you'd only see in a hybrid inverter, but these units come with it. The 6000 XP comes with it as well. The 12000 XP though is unique in that way where you would AC couple into the smart port here, which does leave the generator port up for use with a generator. Although I do recommend to most people to just get a charge verter. A lot of people have larger generators that work just fine with units like this. So that way, if you do want to AC couple, then you can still have a free generator port here. And for those of you with micro inverters or a grid tied system that you're really wanting to transfer into a battery system or an off-grid system, then the AC coupling is really gonna be something that helps you. I've known people that moved into houses with microinverters on their panels and they really can't use anything. They didn't understand the whole agreement or the agreement went sour where you're not really making anything for your net metering. So for those people, AC coupling is really gonna come in handy. That way they can hook that system into an inverter like this and actually be able to utilize that power. I know a lot of the people with microinverters without any kind of battery backup, when everyone else is out of power, they're out of power also. They've got all that power on their roof and they can't do anything with it. So yeah, that's where AC coupling really shines. And you can send all that power to your loads and to charge your batteries finally, actually do something with it. And the online manual has a whole section on that. So I will leave a link like always, and you guys can follow that if you want to and check out the AC coupling specs. And I'll put a screenshot here to where it is in the manual. Next, I wanted to talk a little bit about wiring. So even though this is an off-grid inverter, it can still utilize the grid. You can use the grid as a backup if the batteries are down, if they've gotten to the point where, you know, it's been cloudy for multiple days, they're low, then they can kick over to the grid and that'll be bypassing through this unit to your critical loads panel. And you can also charge with the grid. So this unit can charge your batteries with grid power as well. And when I referenced a critical loads panel just now, I'm referring to a sub panel that this inverter is going to be supplying power to, not your main grid panel because this is an off-grid inverter. And like I said, while this can utilize the grid, it is not meant to interact with the grid like a hybrid. So I went into a lot more detail on critical loads panels, how to wire your inverter into it, and then how that pertains to your grid in another video I did on the 6000 XP. And I'll make sure to put the link to that video at the end of this one so you guys can check that out if you need any help wiring a critical loads panel or if you have any questions on how that works with an off-grid inverter. 
Okay, so what I wanted to cover next is whether or not you can charge the batteries with a 120 volt generator on the 12,000 XP like you can with the 6,000 XP. And the answer is yes. So I took off L1 here and I'm supplying power from the smart load actually of my 18 kPV, but as far as the inverter is concerned, it could be coming from a generator. So I have just power supplied to L1 on the gen port here. And as you guys can see, it is reading 120 volt input and it's supplying power to the battery. So it's charging the batteries. Should be somewhere around 30 amps, 20 or 30 amps. I can check on that, but yeah, so it is working. So you can do that. Keep in mind, it's limited just like the 6000 XP where if you're doing this while you're charging with that 120 volt AC, you only have L1 to be able to power loads with. And then if you're using that power, then it's gonna be less you're gonna be charging with. So yeah, but it does work. You can charge the batteries with 120 volt input into the generator port on this inverter. All right, guys, that's it for this video. Feel free to keep commenting if you guys have any more questions about it. And hopefully, like I said, probably the more complicated thing that I tried to explain in this video was the combiner box and how I would wire panels into this inverter. So if that didn't help enough, if it wasn't clear enough, just leave a comment down below and I'll try to make it a little clearer if there's anything I can fill in the blanks with. Like I said, I will put some links to combiner boxes in the description below. They actually aren't overly complicated. They're actually pretty easy to wire up and they keep everything real clean. So yeah, it's not complicated, but it does add an extra layer there. So there is a little bit more cost involved. So to reach that 24,000 watts, in my opinion, or the way I would do it, you would have a little bit more cost in adding a combiner box as well. And just to recap for those interested in sound, we were right around 6,000 watts before it started to ramp up. I think over seven is where it starts to get what you would consider loud if I had it in the room next to me. Below 6,000 watts, there wasn't much sound. It was just a quiet fan. Keep in mind though that like the other Lux Power inverters, I'm sure it's also temperature sensitive. So if it's in a hot area, even if you're below that wattage, it's probably gonna run the fans a little higher to keep everything cool because they do have thermostats on these units. So they're wattage and thermostat active. So yeah, if it gets a little bit of a higher temperature, they're still gonna kick on. And then if you're pulling in 24,000 watts, nothing's gonna be whisper quiet. Like I've mentioned before, it's not a ninja, <laughs> it's an inverter. So it is gonna make some noise while you're processing stuff there. That's a lot of wattage coming into here, even if you're 12 or 13,000 watts. And I really think it's cool that although you have those 6,000 watt parameters for each leg on this thing, that you can definitely get a way higher surge if you need to on a single leg. I had somebody ask me about a water well and how well it would start that. And I have a three quarter horse water well and actually he did also. So he was just concerned whether or not this would start that up and run it. But actually the 6,000 XP ran my water well. So this definitely will do it. I'm, in fact, it ran uh, quite a bit when I had it hooked up to the house before. I never saw any issues at all. And I know a lot of people, if they're looking at a small off-grid cabin, they're thinking about something small and compact because they don't want something large with a lot of idle consumption. But to be honest, this does not have a high idle consumption and you still get a lot of power. So to me, if you were only gonna have one unit, this would make a lot more sense because you won't have to expand much later. It's already all there for you. So even if you don't plan on using that 12,000 watts, Keep in mind, it's just gonna idle there. So if you really only plan on using around six, seven, eight thousand watts, then this just stays quieter and has to run less. Uh, and just, yeah, overall it's more efficient that way. Because I had somebody ask me recently whether or not the 3000 watt inverter, the EG4 3000, could maintain that 3000 watts 24 hours a day. And maybe so, I, I didn't really run it at 3000 watts for 24 hours, but Really, that's not what you wanna do. If you get an inverter and you need 6,000 watts, don't just get the 6,000 XP. It probably could do it continuously, but yeah, at least go you know a little bit higher than what you need. That way it doesn't have to run at maximum all the time. All right, guys, I'm having a lot of fun with this inverter, so I'm gonna stay with it. Uh, like I said, I'll leave a link in the description below to this and whatever other items I've mentioned in this video. So thanks for watching and stay tuned.